I recently posted a video about point of use water heaters and today I want to respond to some of the comments. I received both good criticism and bad criticism, so starting off with a good, a lot of people told me why not just use a heat pump water heater, because obviously that would use less energy, right? That's the whole point of heat pumps, they take advantage of the COP and while resistive heating has a natural COP equivalent of exactly one, air to water heat pumps can routinely get a COP of 2 to 3, maybe even 4 in the summer, so it seems like they would use less energy, but is this actually correct? Now in the original video I did talk about flow rates, as in liters per minute, and flow rates is where the magic happens. The point of use water heaters make lower flow rates possible. So if you have a COP of 2 to 3 but you use 2 to 3 times more water, well your COP is going to get cancelled out, but how is this even possible? Like why would the heat source change the amount of water that you're using. It seems to make no sense on the surface, but it's gonna make sense once you consider the system as a whole. So I did explain how this happens in the original video, but today I'm going to explain it better. So why is your shower designed to create tens of little streams instead of just being a hose and producing one single big stream? The reason why showers are like this is because the multi-stream design allows for more washing to be done with less water. Now this fact holds true for faucets as well, if you want more washing with less water, all faucets should use a multi-stream showerhead style nozzle, but in reality almost none of them actually do this. Almost all faucets that are actually out there use a single stream design, and as a result they need between 4 and 5 liters per minute in order to do the same amount of washing that a multi-stream design would be able to achieve with 1.5 to 2 liters per minute. And this is not magic, it's a known phenomenon. It's used for showers routinely, and people make products that you can attach to faucets to turn them into a multi-stream design as a way to save water without reducing your quality of life. So if this is known and understood, then why do we choose to save water when it comes to showers, but choose to deliberately waste water when it comes to sinks? The answer can be found once you take into consideration the hot water system as a whole. If you have a central water heater that makes hot water for the entire home, you're inevitably going to have pipes that deliver the water to the endpoints, and occasionally these can be short, but more often than not, they're going to be quite long, meaning that that when you turn on the faucet, you're first going to have to wait for all of the cold water to get flushed out of the pipework, then you're going to have to wait a bit longer for the pipework to come up to temperature, and only then are you going to actually get hot water coming out of your endpoint. Now this is obviously a waste of water, but more importantly for our discussion, it is a waste of time. In a good scenario, the amount of water that you need to flush can be as little as 1 to 1.5 liters, but very often it's going to be 3 or 4 liters, meaning that with a regular single stream faucet at 4 to 5 liters per minute, you can expect waiting times of between 20 and 50 seconds, which is already long enough to be annoying. But if you were to take the same regular faucet supplied by a central water heater and slap a multi stream nozzle onto it, you're gonna cut that flow down to 1.5 to 2 liters per minute, meaning that you are now going to be looking at waiting times between 40 seconds and 2 minutes, at least twice as annoying. And so if you're using a central water heater, most people are not going to want to put up with such a waiting time, and nor should they. So if you ask them to install a multi-stream nozzle on a regular faucet, they're going to say no, and they're going to stick with their single stream design. Now in theory you could also instruct people to like turn up the hot water in order to flush out the pipes quicker and then turn it back down once the hot water actually arrives, but that's not solving the problem, that's asking people to cope with the problem instead of actually addressing it at a system level. But in any case, this is the unintuitive part. 
because in theory there's no apparent reason why your choice of heating solution should affect your choice of water flows, but in reality they tend to come as a package. If your heating solution can deliver instant hot water, then a multi-stream nozzle with appropriate flow is an option, but if your heating solution does not deliver instant hot water, then your only real option is the excessive flow of the single stream nozzle. Now of course there are situations where the lines can be blurred, where a central water heater can deliver instant hot water, and I acknowledged in the original video that this can happen if for example your water heater is very close to the endpoints. A lot of people have the water heater installed in the kitchen and then the kitchen also shares a wall with the bathroom so from their water heater to any of the endpoints it's like 2 meters of pipe work and it's almost instant. So for them they could get the best of both worlds by using a multi-stream nozzle on the central water heater presumably running on a heat pump. But at the same time I also know one individual for whom the water heater is in the kitchen but the bathroom is located at the other end of the the home and I kid you not when I was at their home they had a multi-stream nozzle installed on their kitchen faucet and a single stream nozzle installed on their bathroom faucet and this was years ago at the time I had no idea about any of this the only reason I even remember is because it was my first time seeing this kind of attachment that they had in the kitchen but in retrospect bro seriously knew what's up but for most people for whom the central water heater is not located either in the kitchen or in the bathroom and it's most likely located somewhere in the corner of the house or even outside in the garage or in a technical room, while well, for you the problem of the pipe runs and wasteful single stream nozzles can be entirely circumvented by using the point of use water heaters. And so to recap, even just on a strict energy basis, going from point of use resistive water heaters to central heat pump water heaters is actually going to make your energy consumption remain about the same if that transition requires a jump in water usage, which it usually does. And so if the energy profile is a toss up, then the point of use water heater is going to win this comparison thanks to all of its other benefits. Lower waiting times, not competing with showers for the flow, not competing with showers for the volume, the hot water can't run out, and also just straight up water usage. I mean, you should not discount the cost of the water, by the way, because it isn't negligible. It could be as high as 50% of the operating cost of an endpoint, meaning that you could easily have a scenario where the heat pump system is found to use slightly less energy, but the system cost is still slightly higher because the cost of the higher water usage closes the price gap. So I definitely stand by my position that even if you have a central heat pump water heater, you should still use point of use resistive water heaters for the sinks in the vast majority of cases, because the energy aspect is probably a wash and the life quality aspect favors point of use. Now some people in the comments tried to tell me that some of the lifestyle benefits I mentioned are fake because they told me that hot water running out is not a thing, but it is a thing. Now I've always lived with unlimited hot water, so I don't have a lot of first-hand experience with water tanks, but the only reason why I actually decided to make that original video is because someone that I know moved into a house with a heat pump water heater and one of the first things that they told me is that hot water regularly runs out now not only as a result of multiple showers in quick succession, but also sometimes as a result of people doing the dishes. And that's when I realized that these electric faucets are actually much more generalizable than I thought they were. Because that's when I found out that people with water tanks really can benefit from them because hot water running out is a thing that actually happens. Honestly, it's a bit ironic. I mean, the only reason why I decided to make that video is because I realized that it's generalizable to people with heat pump water tanks and then I got comments about how this is not generalizable to people with heat pump water tanks. But perhaps if you've never lived with unlimited hot water you kinda don't know what you're even missing out on. Anyway, this addresses the heat pump comments, but we have more good criticism and one of them 
is district heating. If you have access to district heating, would it still be wise to use these faucets? And I think the answer depends almost entirely on the details of your system. If the system is such that you get instant hot water at your endpoints, well that means that once again you can get the best of both worlds. You can pair a multi-stream nozzle with the regular faucet. But if your district heating system is set up such that you still have a pipe run and you have to flush out the cold water, then I would go with point of use faucets for some of the same reasons. Obviously with district heating you don't have to worry about the hot water running out, but you still have to worry about waiting times and wasting water. And frankly the heat from district heating is not even that cheap from my quick googling, so once again if you get to use significantly less hot water, you might end up cheaper on the energy aspect as well. But here's the thing, if you currently have access to district heating, that's a great resource that you can use to your advantage, but if your building does not currently have access to district heating right now, it's likely never going to have it in the future either. And the reason for this is that in the 21st century, wages are too high and fuel is too cheap, and it just doesn't make financial sense to lay down new pipework anymore. Quite famously, this happened to the relatively new Dublin Waste to Energy plant, where the developer built all of the hardware necessary to produce free heat by running the incinerator in CHP mode, but the city was not able to find private investors that are willing to invest in a district heating system, and so the heat cannot actually be delivered to any customers, and instead, the free heat gets rejected to the ocean. In the future, I expect that this problem is only going to get worse for small and medium-sized buildings, and district heating solutions are going to be restricted to the largest of multifamily buildings. Everything so far has been good criticism. Although I disagree with it, I believe that they are good questions, so I'm happy to make my arguments again and make them better. But they also got some bad criticism, such as the claim that these point-of-use water heaters are going to be terrible for the grid. In my opinion, this is very obviously false, but let's go through the arguments nonetheless. The claim goes like this. With a traditional water heater, it heats up slowly throughout the day, and thus it acts just like a battery, smoothing out the energy consumption, preventing power spikes, and helping the electrical grid. But if everybody had point-of-use water heaters like I do, then in the morning and evenings all of us would be turning them on at the same time, thus causing a huge spike in the demand for electrical power, and the electrical grid is not good at dealing with spikes like this, and therefore this would be bad, the solution is not scalable. Now most of that is actually true, but the sum of the parts turns out to be wrong, and that is because the size of the power spike is assumed to be a lot, lot larger than it would be in reality. So think about it like this. I have a point of use water heater and the moment I turn the hot water on, I also put a 3 kilowatt load on the grid. Now you have a central water heater. The moment you turn the water on, you start removing some of the hot water from the water tank that is full at this time because it filled up during the day. As soon as you remove some of that hot water, the thermostat is going to notice that the tank is no longer full and it's going to take the appropriate measures to remedy this, aka it's going to turn on the heating element. The heating element which is 3 kilowatts. So the moment you turn on your faucet, almost immediately you put a 3 kilowatt load on the grid. It's the same thing, why am I even discussing this? And yes, maybe it's not 3 kilowatts. For instance, if you have a heat pump water heater as opposed to a traditional one, then it's not going to be 3 kilowatts that kicks on, it's probably going to be 1 or 2 kilowatts, but this is not the part that matters. The part that matters is that single digit kilowatt powers like this have long been established to be fine as transient loads that switch on and off quickly like this. I mean, kettles are 2 to 3 kilowatts, hair dryers are 1.5 kilowatts, air fryers are up to 2 kilowatts, electric ovens are up to 3 kilowatts, mini splits are 1 kilowatt, central ACs are 3 kilowatts, electric cooktops are up to 4 kilowatts or even more, EV chargers are up to 11 kilowatts, so all of this is fine, the numbers are low enough to be fine, you don't need to worry about 3 kilowatts. 
But the real life proof that this is fine actually goes a lot, lot further because there are entire countries, large countries like Vietnam and Brazil, where resistive electric point of use water heaters are kind of the default, not only 3 kilowatts for the sinks, but up to 5 or 8 kilowatts for the showers. This is what almost everybody in these countries uses and their grid is not crashing. So while you're sitting there telling me about how it doesn't work in theory, how it doesn't scale, the Brazilians are in the same comment section telling all of you about how great they actually scale in practice. This is a joke that I made in the original video as well, I said it works in practice, but does it work in theory? And sure enough, I reported my findings in practice and I had comments trying to disprove them in theory, like, bro, I'm telling you this is enough flow, I'm telling you this is enough heat, I'm telling you this is enough power, the Brazilians are telling you that it scales, we have the experimental data, we know that it works, and if your theory disagrees, it's your theory that needs adjusting, that's how theory works. Anyway, a lot of these grid impact comments did begin with something along the lines of I haven't watched the video, but, and honestly, I don't know if that makes them better or worse. That's everything for now then. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe.